And, and I'd love to introduce our speaker for today, Julia. Um, I'll read her wonderful bio to you and then cede the rest of the time to her so she can do as she pleases with it. Julia Silgi is a software engineer at our studio where she works on open source modeling tools. She holds a PhD in astrophysics and has worked as a data scientist in tech and the nonprofit sector, as well as technical advisory committee member for the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. She is an author, an international keynote speaker, and a real world practitioner focused on data analysis and machine learning. Julia loves text analysis, making beautiful charts, and communicating about technical topics with diverse audiences. So without further ado, Julia, go ahead. Thank you so, so much for that lovely introduction. Um, all right, so I'm really happy to be here um, talking with you all here, um, specifically about um, about feature engineering um, for text data. And I think like I I think this is such a great and important topic for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that having a better understanding of what we do to text data to make it appropriate as input for machine learning al algorithms has a whole lot of benefits. Um, both if you are, you know, directly getting ready to try to do this, like to try to train a model with text as inputs, um, or if you're at the beginning of a text analysis project um, and you, you know, as you go through various in like analysis steps, you kind of understand how these steps may be used uh, or, you know, maybe by your own self at some future point for feature engineering. Um, or it's useful to understand this if you're trying to understand the behavior of a model that you're interacting with in some way, you know, and we do this through, um, um, uh, you know, cloud machine learning or AI services. And, you know, honestly, we do it a lot in our daily lives now, right? Like dealing with the outputs of models um, um, that were trained using text data. And so understanding more about how this happens has a really wide, really wide range of benefits. So um, when we build models for text, either supervised models or unsupervised models, we start with something that looks like this. Um, this is um, just some example data. I'm going to use it a couple of times during this talk. Um, this, it's an example data that describes animals, and then we have some information on their, um, uh, uh, some like quantitative structured information on their diet, like what kind of diet they have. So this looks familiar to, to me and to you as like writers and speakers of human language. We can look at this. Um, I, I could... I could read it out loud to you. I can like read it in my head and understand what it says. So this kind of data here, this kind of like natural language is being generated all the time um, in all kinds of contexts. So if you work in um, healthcare or finance or tech, um, I mean, not to mention that like actual like digital humanities, right? Um, we see, we see this kind of like text data um, being generated by um, electronic health records by survey takers, by um, different kinds of, um, <clears throat> uh, by, you know, from social media, from, um, uh, you know, like, like there's tons of uh, processes, uh, or like organizational processes that generate this kind of text. So we got a lot of this. Um, however, uh, computers are not great at doing math on language that is represented like this. Um, and instead, um, when language has to be dramatically transformed to like a machine readable numeric representation. Um, and it will look more like this to, um, to be ready for computation for like basically any kind of a model. Um, so I spent a fair amount of time working on um, uh, software for people to do exploratory data analysis and um, like visualization, summarization, and so forth with text data in a tidy format where we have one observation per row. Um, but when it comes time to build a model, like to use um, some kind of um, underlying mathematical implementation, uh, we, we almost always need something like this. 
uh, which is um, like this particular thing here is called a document term matrix. So we've got um, the, the, and this matrix, the columns are all, they all belong to terms, the rows, each row is a different document. And what goes in there is in this particular example is the counts. How many times is uh, a document use a certain word? So the, the exact representation may differ from like this. You might weight by TFIDF instead of counts, or we might have, um, we might keep sequence information. Like instead of counting up things or waiting, we might like keep track of where in a document did a certain word or token happen. But for basically all text modeling from, um, you know, simpler models like naive Bayes to, um, you know, word embeddings or even anything like very state of the art today, like say transformer models, we have to heavily feature engineer and process language to get it ready for it to, for a, a representation that's suitable for machine learning algorithms. So I work um, on in my day job on an open source framework in R for modeling and machine learning that's called Tidy Models. And a lot of the examples I'll be showing today use um, Tidy Models code. So some of the specific goals of the Tidy Models project are to provide a consistent, um, flexible framework for real world modeling practitioners from those just starting out uh, be beginners to very experienced people um, to harmonize the heterogeneous interfaces that we have within R and to encourage good statistical practice. So I'm glad to get to show a little bit of what it is that I work on and build and how it applies to text modeling. But a lot of what we're going to be talking today isn't that super specific to tidy models. It isn't even really that specific to R. Instead, we're focusing on um, these basics, these basics of how we transform text into predictors for machine learning. So uh, tidy models is a meta package in a similar way that the tidyverse is. So if you've ever typed library tidyverse and then use, you know, ggplot2 for visualization and dplyr for data manipulation, uh, tidy models works um, uh, uh, is a similar way in, in that um, because it turns out modeling has a lot of sort of different pieces to it, like a lot of sort of different kinds of tasks. So pre-processing or feature engineering, what we're focusing on this today, is part of a broader model process. Um, it starts, well, I mean, you really might argue it starts with like exploratory data analysis. Um, and then let's say it comes to completion with um, model evaluation, with you saying you understanding how well your model is performing. So tidy models as a piece of software is made up of R packages, each of which has a specific focus, like um, resampling data. That's what R sample is for, for resampling data or, or hyperparameter tuning. That's what tune is for, it's for hyperparameter tuning. And one of these packages is, is a package for feature engineering, for, for um, implementing feature engineering transformations. It is the one that's called um, recipes. So in tidy models, we capture um, uh, the concepts of data pre-processing and feature engineering in this idea of a, um, a pre-processing recipe that has steps. So you choose which ingredients or variables you're going to use. You define the steps that um, you want to take. Then you prepare them. You prepare those, those steps applied with those ingredients. And then you can apply that recipe to any kind of new data set, like um, testing data if you're in the process of training your model, or new data if you've like put your model into production and you're getting new predictions. So the variables or ingredients that we use in modeling come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, and that includes text data. So some of the techniques and approaches that we use for pre-processing text data are the same as um, for any other kind of data that we might have. Uh, but some of what you need to know to be able to do a good job in this process for text is different and is specific to the nature of language data. So I, um, in the wrong window. 
There we go. Okay. So um, I've written a book with my um, co-author, Emil V. Felt, um, on supervised machine learning um, for text, uh, for text analysis in R. And um, fully the first third of the book focuses on how we transform natural language into features for modeling. The middle section of the book is how to use those features that we create in um, uh, what you might call like simpler or more traditional machine learning models, like say like regularized regression, support vector machines, um, other ones, other more straightforward machine learning models that work well with text. The last third of the book talks about how we use deep learning models with text data. So deep learning models still um, still do require these kinds of transformations um, that we where we go from natural language and we end up with some mathematical representation. You don't, um, deep learning models don't get you out of the um, need for this, for understanding this kind of pre-processing. They are different and they are often able to inherently learn structure or features from text, but it does not, using deep learning models doesn't get you out of the need for um, doing feature engineering and understanding feature engineering for text altogether. So this book is now complete and available. Um, folks have print copies and it's also available in its, um, it's available in its entirety at um, smalltar.com. That's how we like to say it, smalltar, like it's a dragon or something, I think. So if you are new to dealing with text data, um, understanding these sort of like fundamental pre-processing approaches for text will set you up for being able to um, for being able to train effective models. If you're really experienced with text data, um, you probably have noticed that. Um, uh, like, you know, like this was part of our motivation for working on this book is that existing, the existing literature is kind of sparse when it comes to like, a, like detailed, thoughtful explorations of how these pre-processing steps work and how um, choices uh, made in these feature engineering steps tend to impact our model output. So let's walk through a couple of these kinds of examples and, ta and um, talk about how they work. And let's start with what you might think of as the first or the most basic, and that is um, tokenization. So this is typically one of the first steps of transformation um, from natural language to machine learning feature. And to be honest, also with any kind of text analysis, including um, exploratory data analysis before you build a model, um, uh, tokenization is often the first thing you need to do in all of these um, situations. So in tokenization, we take an input, a string, and a token type, which is some uh, meaningful unit of text, such as a word, and then we split the input into pieces or tokens that correspond to that type. So most commonly, the meaningful unit of text um, or type of token that we want to split our text into is, um, is a word. So this might, you might be like, oh yeah, okay, thanks. That's super exciting. It might seem straightforward, but it turns out it's difficult to clearly define what a word is for even, um, for many or even most languages. So many languages don't use white space between words for you to use white space for tokenization. Um, languages that do use white space, like English, um, often have you know particular examples that are ambiguous. And um, Romance languages, like Italian or French or Spanish, often use um, pronouns or negation words that may be better considered prefixes with a space. Um, and then we've got English contractions like didn't that may more accurately be considered two words with no space. So it is um, the these once we have tokenized text, it's on its way to being able to be used in EDA. So we we make some choice and then we um, we can use it in EDA, unsupervised algorithms or as features for predictive modeling, which is what these results are shown here. So these are from um, a regression model that was trained on the descriptions of media from artwork in the Tate collection. So um, media meaning like what kind of art medium was used to create a piece of art. So um, and what we're what we're predicting with this model is when it was um, when it was created. So these uh, what we see here is that. Um, 
artwork created using like graphite, watercolor, engraving. This is more likely to be created earlier, like with older art. And artwork created using um, photography, screen printing, and, um, and dung and glitter. This is more likely to be created later, like from newer, more contemporary art. So the way that we tokenized this, um, this natural human generated language that we started with, you know, describing the medium of the artwork, um, the way that we tokenize each, um, uh, each, each uh, uh, description has a big impact on what we learn from it. If we had tokenized in a different way, we would have gotten different results, um, uh, both in terms of um, the performance, the model um, performance, and both also in terms of like how we interpret the model, like what we learn from it. If we use a different tokenization strategy, we would end up with different different results. Um, th there are other ways to tokenize text. Um, another way is to, um, instead of breaking text up into single words or tokens, which is called unigrams, you can tokenize to n-grams. So an n-gram is a continuous sequence of n items from a given sequence of text. So um, this, what I'm showing on the screen here, is, this shows that same text from before describing this animal divided up into bigrams or n-grams with two tokens. So notice how the words in the bigrams overlap so that we get to, um, uh, we see the word, the word collared there in both of the first two um, bigrams. So n-gram tokenization slides along the text to create overlapping sets of tokens. This shows trigrams for the same text. So um, we have, you know, a sliding window of three words that slides around identifying trigrams. So, you know, if you go down a little bit, it's like as a javelina, a javelina or a javelina or a musk, you know, and so forth. So um, uh, uh, using unigrams is um, faster and more efficient um, to identify and then to do model on. But the, um, we, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, yes, yes, we got that sliding along. So they are, um, we've got the overlapping bit there. Um, so uh, we don't, if we have only unigrams, we don't capture any information about word order. So this, if you ever hear the phrase bag of words, that's what it means. It's like we took all the words and we just threw them in a bag and we just like shuffle them around and we're not using, we're not keeping any information about word order. When we use a higher value for N, that keeps more information. But the vector space of tokens increases dramatically and that corresponds to a reduction reduction in token counts. And, um, you know, depending on your particular data set, you might not be able to get um, good results from um, when we go to higher order n-grams. Combining degrees of n-grams can be a good idea. This allows you to extract different levels of detail from text data. So unigrams tell you which individual words have been a lot of times, used a lot of times, and it, you know, it's not uncommon for some of the most common unigrams to get overlooked if you're lo looking at bigrams or trigrams because they don't co-appear with any other particular word that often. So, so how, how does this turn out? What kind of results do we see? So this plot per compares um, model performance in terms of um, RMSE there on the y-axis, root mean squared error, um, for a lasso regression model where we're predicting the year of Supreme Court opinions with three different degrees of n-grams. So th this whole, this little experiment always holding the number of tokens constant, the total number, number of tokens constant at um, 1,000, which is, you know, kind of, kind of not enormous, um, but, you know, like 1,000 tokens. So here, notice using unigrams alone performed best for this corpus of Supreme Court opinions. Um, and then, you know, we kind of go up with like worse and worse performance as we increase the number of tokens. This isn't always the case, you know, depending on the kind of model you use and the data set itself, like both how big it is and um, how the language in it is used. 
we might see the best performance, um, you know, uh, in a different option, like maybe combining unigrams and bigrams or, or some other option here. Um, in this particular case, if we wanted to incorporate the more complex information that we get in bigrams and trigrams, we probably would need to increase the number of tokens that are kept in the model quite consider considerably. However, you know, there's only so many Supreme Court opinions. Um, like once you, you you can like drop, you know, like if you increase the number of tokens you have, you, you, you know, you're dropping the counts quite dramatically on those tokens. And so you're like, it may, it, in this particular case, it was difficult to get it any better than this. Um, so it's not uncommon for unigrams to end up being the best option for many data sets. Keep in mind that identifying n-grams is computationally expensive. Um, and this is like often especially dramatic when you compare, when you keep in mind um, how much model improvement you often will see. Like it's not uncommon to see like, oh, one is at one level and then we get a little bit of improvement from one to one and two, and then you don't really see any improvement when you add in the threes. Well, you got to look at how much that improvement is and keep it, keep, and keep, understand the computational cost of that. So for this, for this experiment that I'm showing you right here, um, this data set of Supreme Court opinions, um, if you use bigrams and unigrams, that takes more than twice as long to train than only unigrams. Remember, this is the same number of tokens. So um, the time isn't coming, the, that time isn't coming from the model training mostly, it's mostly coming from the feature engineering. If you add in trigrams, it's almost five times as long as training on unigrams alone. And this is like using parallel processing. This is like, this is like using all the tricks we know about. Um, so when you bump up in unigrams, you bump up in computational cost quite a lot. And often your amount of, you know, here it actually got worse. But when you do see improvements, it's often very modest compared to the amount of time you have to spend to get to that. All right, so let's go back the other direction. Let's tokenize to units smaller than words. So these are called character shingles. Um, there's multiple different ways to break words up into subwords um, that are appropriate for machine learning. And um, often these approaches, these tokenization approaches or algorithms have the benefit of being able to encode um, unknown tokens or unknown words at that are new at prediction time. Um, so, you know, like you train you train your whole model with um, the data, your training data set, right? But then when it comes, hey, you put your model into production and you're getting new text in, and one of those new examples of text has a word you didn't see in the training time. Um, Subwords can often match to um, new words, like you, like you know, if you did it with these character shingles, you might match to you know the bel subword and if if it is in fact meaningful like right in that way you can um uh you can not have to just throw that word out entirely so using this kind of subword information is a way to incorporate morphological sequences into our models and that that's a like concept from so from linguistics like ling um words are Put, like put together with morphemes and morphemes often do have meaning in them. And so using subword information is a way to kind of incorporate these kind of like morphological sequences. So these results um, uh, are for a classification model. Um, and, and yeah, for sure, like when there's a question here about like the differences across languages and the thing about um, subword information is that you're getting to like the morphological characteristic of some language and they, you know, like different languages have different morphological characteristics. So these results are for a classification model with a data set of very short text, just the names of post offices in the US. So um, I created features for the model that are subwords of these post office names. So not character shingles like I showed you before, but like a different approach for finding subword information and um, the it, and a, a linear support vector machine here. And so we end up learning that names that start with H or P or contain that ALE subword are more likely to be in Hawaii 
And on the flip side, the subwords and like and or land, um, R I I N G, um, those things over over there in that pink color, those are um, subwords that are more likely to be outside of Hawaii. So there's a question about um, so a character shingle is an example of a kind of subword. Um, I if you're interested in learning more about the particular algorithm that is used here, I suggest you go to that to the website here, and it walks through like exactly like what's the algorithm that's used. There's different ways of dividing words up into subwords. Character shingles would be the most simple, but there's more um, more complex ways of doing it too. So, so here again, we see that like the way that we tokenized um, determined what we learned, determined how well we were able to predict whether a post office were in, is in Hawaii or not, and um, it determined what, like the choice that we made determines what, what it is that we learn. So um, in tiny models, we collect all these kinds of decisions about tokenization in code that looks like this. So we start with a recipe that specifies what ingredients or variables we'll use, and then we define pre-processing steps. Here we just have one um, where we're going to tokenize the text. This will, this example here will tokenize um, N of one, two, and three um, bigrams. So unigrams, bigrams, trigrams. That's what that options does there. So even at this first and arguably like, you know, pretty simple or most basic step, the choices that we make um, affect our modeling results um, in, in a big way. So next, let's talk about stop words. So once we have split text into tokens, we often find that not all the tokens, you know, or words carry the same amount of information. If maybe any information at all for a machine learning task. So common words that are, you know, believed or found to carry little to maybe no um, meaningful information are called stop words. So it's common advice and practice to remove stop words um, like these for various NLP tasks. So what I'm showing here is the entirety of one of the shorter um, English stop word lists that's used very broadly. Um, so we see, you know, lots of pronouns, lots of conjunctions like you. These are like glue words that are used to make a sentence make sense um, and to structurally work. But we, you know, we look at these and we're like, ah, that's not, those are not super meaningful on their own. It turns out that that decision just to remove stop words is a bit more involved and um, maybe more fraught than um, what you'll find, I think, often reflected in a lot of, um, you know, tutorials or resources out there. So almost all the time, uh, like real world NLP practitioners use pre-made stop word lists. So this plot visualizes set intersections for three common stop word lists in English um, in what is called an upset plot. So this is a, a specific kind of plot, an upset plot. So um, the horizontal bars tell you the length of each set. The, the, hor the vertical bars tell you the length of the set intersections. And then we have, you know, those, those like barbell things are telling you um, which set intersection we're talking about. So notice a couple of things. The lengths of the lists are quite different. Um, notice they don't all contain um, the same sets of words. So that really the most important thing to remember about stop word lexicons is that they are not created in some neutral, perfect setting, but instead they are context specific and they can be biased. So um, these things are both true because these lists are created from large data sets of language. Um, so they, they reflect the characteristics of the the data that were um, that were used in their creation. So this is the list of the 10 words that are in the smart lexicon, but not in the snowball lexicon. Notice they're all contractions, but actually that's not because the snowball lexicon doesn't include contractions. It actually has a lot. So, um, but just not these, right? So, so think about what, how this happened. Like, how did this happen? People had a large data set of language and um, make some choices and we end up here. Also notice that um, that, that, that lexicon has he's 
but not she's. Notice that there's there's pairs here of um, of things. So, and this is just like, like one tiny example of the kind of bias that occurs in these lists. These lists are created from large data sets of text. Lexicon creators look at the most frequent words in some big corpus of language, they make a cutoff, and then they decide, may make some decisions, right, about what to include or exclude um, around the cutoff, and then you end up here. Um, so, like the large, when the um, large data set of language that you start with, you know, maybe discusses men more often than it discusses women, you end up in this kind of a situation. So like so many decisions when it comes to modeling with language, so we as practitioners have to decide like when, like what is appropriate for my particular domain. It turns out this is even true for picking a stop word list. So in tidy models, we can implement a pre-processing step like this one by adding an additional step to our recipe. So first we specified what variables we'll use, then we tokenized the text, and now we're removing stop words. Here we're just removing a default set of stop words, but um, this is something you can um, change with different arguments there. So this plot um, looks, you kind of explores an experiment seeing like what happens when we remove different um, stop words. So it's the same, the same modeling problem as what I showed before, um, the supreme accord opinions and modeling whether they're recent or old. Um, and this uses uh, three different stop word lexicons that have different lengths. So um, the snowball lexicon contains the smallest number of words. And in this case, it results in the best performance. So removing fewer words results in better performance. You take out more words in this case, and the performance gets worse. Um, this specific result is not generalizable to all data sets and all contexts. But the fact that removing different sets of stop words can have, you know, meaningfully different results, that is transferable. The fact that we will see a difference it is something that happens um, very commonly. Like one set of stop words will work well and one will be much worse. The only way to know, it turns out, <laughs> is to try, is to try several options. There's no way to know ahead of time um, for sure, like what will work best with your data. This really highlights how machine learning is a um, an empirical um, field. Um, we we you know there's there's not so much about a machine learning that you can like say ahead of time um, you how you know what is going to be best for solving a given problem. Um, uh, we, the only way to know is by trying different options. This makes it extremely, extremely important that you use good statistical practice so that you are not fooled into um, thinking something is better when it's not. It just really highlights like uh, so issues around, which I won't get into a ton today, but like resampling your data, you being very careful about data leakage, both in feature engineering and in your modeling. Um, the, it becomes very important in machine learning to do these things because um, the only way to know what works is by trying. So now let's talk about um, another, another step, another um, possible feature engineering step. So often when we deal with text, um, we often, we have documents that contain versions of one um, base word, um, which we call a stem in this context. So say, say we're not interested in the difference between animals, S, and animal, you know, just singular. What if we want to treat them both together? Um, that, that is the idea at the heart of stemming, identifying the stems of words. So the, I, here's a shock. There's no one or right, correct way to stem, <laughs> stem text. So this plot shows, um, three approaches for stemming for this um, this uh, example data set of like animals, of animal descriptions. Uh, it starts off with, okay, what if we just literally remove the final S um, to that middle one, there is a more slightly more complex set of rules about handling plural endings that is called the S stemmer. That middle one has a name, it's called the S stemmer. And then on the on the pink, the pink one is um, one of the best known implementations of stemming uh, that's called the Porter algorithm. So 
Porter, so it's like a step, the way Porter stemming works is it's like a step-by-step -step set of rules. Like, okay, if it has this at the end, change to this. If, if not, go to step D, you know, like it's like a set of very algorithmic step-by-step -step set of rules about how to handle endings. Um, Porter stemming, if you look here, is the most different from the other two. Um, you know, just kind of notice here, this is the top 20 tokens after stemming. Just notice like how species was handled differently, um, animal, predator, the sort of combination of live, living, life, lives, like like look at how that was kind of handled differently by these different stemming, um, uh, stemming algorithms. So practitioners typically are interested in stemming text data because it can bucket tokens together that belong that belong together um, in some way that we understand it. So we can use these kinds of stemming rules, um, which are, like I said before, these like step by step rules based um, uh, algorithms. So think of them as very like the, ah, yes, this is what an algorithm is. If you look it up in like a, what is an algorithm, you know, kind of thing. Um, we can also use lemmatization, which works in a different way. The, the um, purpose of lemmatization is to identify lemmas, which are very similar in concept to the idea of a stem. Um, but um, it's different in that it is, instead of based on like a step or a set of rules that you go through, instead those are based on large dictionaries of text that, and that incorporates linguistic understanding of which words belong together. So lemmatization usually depends on um, you have you have like a large data set of language and you um, you you can make dictionaries and you can say ah animal and animals go together you know because of um, uh, how the diction you know like how we have a dictionary that tells us that instead of using like a rule a set of rules to take off the ending so these are kind of like the two the two approaches think of one as rules based and one as linguistics based um, so this seems like it's going to be a helpful thing to do when, um, beca because we, when we're dealing with text, we have so many features um, in text data. It's like, oh, look at all these features. I, when I tokenize text, at the end, the features that I need to use are the, um, the words, the tokens. And if you say, oh, I've got too many, I've got too many tokens, let me, um, let me bucket them together. So this here is like a, a, a matrix representation of text data, much like we could use in most te uh, models. So I want to note you to notice how many features there are. 16, almost 17,000 features. And also notice how sparse this matrix is. Um, it's extremely, extremely sparse. Um, think of this as the sparsity of the data that we want to use to build a supervised machine learning model. Um, text data is sparse data because um, of the way natural language works. We tend to use a few words a lot and there are a lot of words that we only use a few times. So we end up in this situation where we have very, very sparse data. So if I were to stem this text with um, the Porter algorithm, we reduce the number of features by a lot, by many thousands. The sparsity here didn't change that much. So it's like, well, we're still going to have to deal with like some pretty darn sparse data. But um, common sense, you know, might say like, oh, reducing the number of word features that dramatically is going to help. That is going to improve our um, performance. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So a sparse data, that's exactly right. Sorry, sparse matrix is a matrix where most of the values are zero. And only a few of the val of only a few of the elements of the of the matrix or array have something in there. So when this says that it's like 98% sparse, it has it is made of 98% zeros. 98% of the elements are zeros in this matrix. <clears throat> um, so so common sense says that like re reducing the the number of features here is gonna it's gonna help. Like that's gonna help our model perform better. Um, but that does assume that we haven't lost any info important information by stemming. It turns out that um, uh, ste like stemming, both stemming and lemmatization can be helpful in some contexts. But it turns out that typical stemming algorithms 
and lemmatization less so, but stemming algorithms a lot, lemmatization a little bit, you know, like less. They are built, uh, you think of them as aggressive. They're aggressive. They've been to built to favor um, sensitivity or recall or the true positive rate. And that is, you know, just because there's no free lunch at the expense of specificity or precision or the true negative rate. So in a supervised machine learning context, um, this affects the model's um, positive predictive value, um, the, um, the, precision, the precision. So this is the ability to not incorrectly label true negatives as positives. I think I said that right. <laughs> Don't, maybe, you know, we can check, check on that. But um, uh, so basically like stemming can increase a model's ability to find the positive examples. Like if we were saying, uh, doing a classification model about an animal's diet, um, it can help us find the positive examples, the animal descriptions associated with the diet. Um, however, if the text is overstemmed, the resulting model like loses its ability to label the negative examples, say the, the descriptions that are um, not about that certain diet. Um, it can, it like struggles to label those correctly. So um, even these really like um, very common basic pre-processing steps for text, like what is shown in this feature engineering recipe, like um, they can be computationally expensive. Um, they can, um, uh, and, and they have um, these, cho and these choices, like whether to remove stop words or not, whether to stem text or not, um, these all have dramatic impact on how machine learning models of all kinds perform. So what this means is like as practitioners where we are, um, you know, like we're learning, we're teaching, we're writing, we're doing the work that we do, um, like folk, like being clear about what feature engineering steps we did take and um, being clear about what the kind of impact can be contributes to like better, more robust statistical practice in our field. I want to go back to the idea of the sparsity of text data. So this is one of the really defining characteristics of text. Um, uh, we end up with um, uh, a relationship that looks like this in terms of how sparsity changes as you add more documents, thus more unique words to a corpus. So this is, um, let's take a data set, uh, a real data set of documents. Let's start with, um, you know, like let's start with 10% of the documents and then go, go add more and more. And as we're doing that count, how many unique words are there? Um, how sparse does it get? How fast? And then how much memory does it take in a computer to hold it? So notice that as we add more unique words, the sparsity goes up really fast um, to, to very high. Like this is very, very sparse data. And also notice what's happening to how much you know, RAM that takes in your computer, how much memory it takes in your computer to hold that information. It turns out this that I'm showing you right here is, is already using specialized data structures meant to store sparse data. Like often if you have a regular matrix, you'll keep track of the whole thing, including any zeros, but there's specialized data structures that help you, um, that, that, are more efficient at storing sparse data where instead of holding a whole two-dimensional thing, it keeps track of the column, the row, the value, the column, the row, the value, the column, the row, the value. So you don't keep track of the zeros. You're just like, ah, oh, all the rest of them are zero, you know? This plot I'm showing you is using that kind of sparse data structure already. So even if you try like the computational tricks that you have, we still end up growing the memory required to handle these kinds of data sets in a really nonlinear way. This means, you know, you may just straight up run out of memory, um, but also this means it takes quite a long time to train, to train your model. This is why training models on text data tends to be quite challenging. Uh, people have known about this for a long time, and linguists have worked for a long time on vector 
models for language that can reduce the number of dimensions representing text data based on how people are using language. <clears throat> so this, this, people have been working on this for a long time. This quote actually dates to 1957, before, like, you know, everyone had <clears throat> computers in their, you know, houses or anything like this. So um, this idea of, like, let's look at how words are used together and then um, uh, take our super high dimensional sparse data, use that information to create dense word vectors. These are also called word embeddings. So the idea here is that we can use statistical modeling. Uh, you know, you can just use something straightforward like matrix factorization, or you can use fancy air math like neural networks, which is like fancy matrix <laughs> factorization. And you can take this, um, really high dimensional space and you can create a new lower dimensional space that is um, special because this new lower dimensional space is created based on vectors that incorporate information on which words are used together. So this is like an approach uh, for saying, I am going to make it more practical for me to train the models using the fact that um, words are not independent. You don't, you don't just like, like our words are not just some like scramble of like equally, you know, um, likely words that we just use together. Words are used together in very specific ways. So this is, let's use that information to make these dense word embeddings so I can, um, I can train a model. Yeah, my, my words also very scrambled. <laughs> So you need a really big data set of text to create or learn word embeddings. So this is a table that I'm showing right here from a set of embeddings that I created using a corpus of complaints to the United States Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So um, this is, uh, you know, the CF. A PB, if you've, you know, seen it around. So these are complaints from consumers about things like credit cards and mortgages and similar, like something went wrong with my student loan payment, like, you know, the company did something bad or something like that. So in the new space that is defined by these embeddings that I created, the word month is closest in this new space to um, the word year, months, monthly installments, um, payment. You know, people are talking about the payment from the certain month or the, you know, the installment in the certain month, weeks and weeks. So, so these are words that are close together in the new space because they're used together or in similar ways. Um, let's look at another one. So in the new space defined by these embeddings I made, um, the word error is closest to like mistake, clerical, problem, glitch, errors, um, miscommunication, misunderstanding. So people are like, oh, there was an error with my student loan payment. And it's like, oh, a clerical glitch, you know, like, uh, like we, I, there was a misunderstanding about, <laughs> about my mortgage, you know, or like, like these are the kinds of things people are saying. Um, so you don't have to create embeddings yourself. In fact, it's very common to use um, pre-trained word embeddings. These are created by um, someone else uh, based on some huge corpus of data that they have access to and you probably don't. Um, it, you know, we're talking, we're talking like Google, we're talking, um, uh, Facebook has made some, like there are these pre-trained embeddings that people make available um, uh, for use. So let's look at that space. So this table shows the results for the same word, but from what are called the glove embeddings. So um, the glove embeddings, to give you an idea, are trained on like all of Wikipedia, a bunch of the Google News data sets, like, like huge swaths of the internet, like put it into a giant computer, find the word embeddings. So let's look here. So some of the closest words in the space are very similar to before, right? Uh, mistake, errors. But um, we no longer have some of that like domain specific flavor, like clerical discrepancy and like misunderstanding. And now we do have probability and calculation. And um, people were not talking about those things when they talked about their um, financial product complaints. You know, people were not using those kind of words. So this highlights for you that embeddings are trained or learned from a large corpus of text data. 
and the characteristics of that corpus become part of the embeddings. So, you know, like machine learning in general is exquisitely sensitive to the, you know, the data, like whatever is in your training data, like it's going to learn it and, um, and like reify it, right? Um, and this is never more obvious than when dealing with text data and maybe maybe most with word embeddings because what you're literally doing is trying to learn the way language is used together to make these lower dimensional um, embeddings so this means you know you might you might miss out on when you then if you apply those pre-trained embeddings to your own data you might miss out right on something that is there you might be trying to add in something that isn't there and you know maybe most concerning from an ethical standpoint um, any like human prejudice or bias in the corpus becomes imprinted into the embeddings so um, in fact, when we look at some of these most commonly available embeddings that are out there that are able that are available for for use, we see that um, uh, African American first names that are more typical for African Americans are associated with more unpleasant feelings than European American white American first names. Um, women's first names are more associated with family and men's first names are more associated with career and um, terms associated with women like these are things like mother, aunt, um, sister are more associated with the arts and terms associated with men like like the brother, uncle, you know, father, they're most more associated with science. So bias actually is so ingrained in word embeddings that the embeddings can be used to quantify change in social attitudes over time. Like you can actually, you if like digital humanities folks have like taken the embeddings, like like say slice up your data in decade bins or something and then find embeddings and then measure the bias in the embeddings over time and can use that to measure changes and attitudes about um, uh, in various social attitudes over time. <clears throat> so um, word embeddings are, are pretty like exaggerated or extreme example, but um, it turns out that all the feature engineering decisions that we make when it comes to text data have, um, have a big effect on our results, both in terms of um, model performance and also in terms of um, how appropriate or fair our models are. So uh, to sum up, when it comes to pre-processing your text data, like creating these features that you need to build a model with, you have a lot of options and I think quite a bit of responsibility. So my advice is always to start with simpler models so that you can understand, that you're able to as understand quite um, clearly and deeply. Um, so you, you have that as a benchmark um, to be sure to adopt good statistical practices um, as you train and tune models so you aren't fooled about um, the model performance you would expect to see with various approaches and also to um, use model explainability tools and frameworks so you can understand um, your more your less straightforward models so these are all things that like my coworkers and i work on and talk about and so we we um we think there's so much possibility and also such important things to keep in mind when it comes to this kind of work. And with that, I will say um, thank you so much. I want to be sure to um, uh, thank my teammates on the Tidy Models team at our studio, as well as my, uh, my co-author on, on this book, um, Emil Wiedfeldt. So thank you. I've got, I do think, I think we have time for a little bit of some questions. Um, the first question I see there is about um, explainability tools. I am going to um, uh, drop a link um, that kind of walks through like how you might go about using one here. Um, that usually what you do um, with most explainability tools is you, um, you, you often like train a model on top of a model or that's one way if you see something called lime that's what that is it trains a little um, uh, linear model on top of your 
complex fancy model other explainability tools you are think of them as like poking at the model like you train a model and you say how does this thing work and so you say well okay uh i've got 500 real examples what if i make my 500 real examples i'm changing something in the input so that they all have the same like um um, I don't know, this example that is houses that I just linked to. So let's say they all, let's make it so they all have the same um, uh, number of bedrooms. And then, and then I put that data in, I get the predictions that I come out. And so it's like, I poked the model and say, how do you work? And the next time I do it, or it take, take say one, say I'm, I'm interested in how price is related to, um, the size of the house, like square footage of the house. So you, so you take 500 of your, you know, real data points. And for each of those, you, you change the, um, square footage from very low to very high. You keep everything else about the house the same and you, but you change the, the square footage and you put it into the model and you see what you get out. And so it's like, you're like, you, you like poke at it to see how it behaves. So that, so most explainability tools, um, work like that. I think I have a time for a, a few more questions if anyone has any. I'll stop sharing. Oh, Todd, do you have one? I was just gonna raise my hand and just, Julia, uh, thank you for joining us. You are a huge inspiration to me and to a lot thank of people you. that I know, uh, but thank you for doing this. This is amazing. Um, NLP is one of the things that I'm working on and it is absolutely kicking my butt. So this is incredible. I love working with text, but it really can be, um, it, you know, there, there are a lot of things that are different about it than uh, like these rectangular data sets that we often get trained on or have more experience with. My, my entire day is filled with this. So yeah, <laughs> I, and I'm learning, I'm still a student, like I'm still learning this, but yeah. Wonderful. Nice. Thank, you. Thank you for those kind words. Yeah, I just have to echo what Todd said. Thank you so much for coming and speaking for us. It's been a really great time to learn from you. Thank you. Yeah, well, I love your YouTube videos. You know, I think you should quit your job and just focus on those. Just do that. Videos. I need to just, just do that. that. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. So I ha I had a question, Julia. I feel like I misunderstood one of the plots. Um, okay. So there was a plot that had um, it. It was like n-grams, I think, and it was there was one. It was one, two, and then one, two, three. Yes. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm trying said, to find it again. Go ahead. It was like I just I think I must have misunderstood it because. When, when you, and it was like, I think it was like mean squared error on the, yeah. And there was less mean squared error when there was just, when it was just one, um, one gram, yeah which, which made me wonder, but, but when you have one, two, does that mean that you've included both one and two in the model? And yes. how, I'm not, I'm, it like blew my mind that it went down. I know. Because, right. Let me <laughs> like, I, would, I have this thing in my head that like more predictors always reduces, reduces. Oh, okay. So it's holding the number of tokens constant. So these all have a thousand tokens. Oh, these, okay. these are, these, this is holding, this is a thousand tokens in each, in each one. Um, okay, so, so all of these not... models have a thousand tokens. Okay. Okay. So okay. can I ask how are the thousand tokens decided on? Because I could kind of imagine, can't you, pick the thousand tokens, like the best one and two grams, like so, to reduce mean squared error? Um, so you could do, so this does not involve in anything fancy in like feature selection, like which ones will we use? Okay. Um, this, it, it, I mean, except that it is a lasso, it's a lasso model. So it's like here, here are a thousand tokens Lasso, please tell me which ones are the best. And um, so the difference is the in the one where it says one, the thousand um, features are all unigrams. 
um, and the way that the cutoff was made was like the um, the thousand most common ones, the thousand most common ones. I can't exactly remember if this was stop words or no stop words, but I can look that up for you. This is from the book, so you can look and see if it did or did not involve you removing stop words. The one and two is it's a thousand tokens of unigrams and bigrams of the, um, so find all the unigrams and bigrams, find what is most common. Um, mm -hmm. like the, find the thousand most common ones. Um, and then lasso, tell me which ones are important. And then, and then you get, get like some result back and it got worse. It did. It got worse. Like if you take the, for the same number of tokens at trying to use bigrams made it worse. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, have... and so what does that, oh, so go ahead, Kristen. I don't want to know if over. you were going to ask more about this, go ahead. I was just say, going to say, well, what does that mean for this data set? That I mean, that, I guess it means that you should use uh, what are what are these ones? The one one yeah, grams. Uni, yeah, right? yeah, one grams. Yeah, one grams or unigrams. Yes, it means you should use one grams or unigrams. It probably means that. Um, uh, I mean, th this is a this is a data set with like I think like in the thousands of examples, and so because. Because if you look at how language is used in Supreme Court opinions, um, you know, 5,000 or whatever examples is not enough to start learning from the bigrams. Mm. It's not enough. You would need way more. You would need way more to be able to learn from bigrams given how... Um, given how language is used here. So it's not always true. Like, it's like, so you might, you know, I, we know this actually Supreme court opinions are written with a very big vocabulary compared to, right, so, so that, you know, like that's related, like you might not get the same result if you're looking at a text that uses more of the common words and less of the uncommon words. So it like, it really depends on the nature of your data and then how much Absolutely. of it you have to be able to learn from. Thank you. That's so insightful. Thank you. Thank you for that great, great question. Um, would including both one and two and one and two, three. Um, yeah, so one, um, one, two and three, or one, two and three. Like those are the three tests that were that were tried. I don't know if that was any more helpful than what I said before, but I'll say uh, it again, but louder. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any last right. questions? Can we keep hanging out afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to meet you all. Um, let's see. You're, you're like, I need, I need NLP. Um, I, I actually do. That is true. I am looking for uh, uh, advisors. I'm looking for people to help us. Uh, I run a, I'm a co-founder of a startup that's working in NLP. So if you know nice. anyone. Um, I, I don't know if they're up for advising, but like, like startups, but, um, I, I, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to, um, I, I might, I, I, I might know some folks if you want to send me an email or something like, I can, would... like see if they're interested. I, I can at least ask, send me an email to remind me and I can at least ask if they would be interested. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, it was so nice to meet you all and to get to talk. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Julia. Thanks. Have a great night.